Greetings and salutations. I am Lickdor. This is a tutorial on EU4. We will be talking about the Mandate of Heaven today, the DLC expansion. Alright, so. Let's play. The Mandate of Heaven was released uh, April 7th, no, 6th, 2017, alongside Patch 1.20. It brought about historical ages, golden eras, I uh, gave new mechanics to the Chinese Empire, most notably Ming here, uh, in its series of tributaries, which we'll discuss. Uh, there, the it redefined how the Japanese uh, shogunate and such worked. It added Manchu banners, which is uh, I would say a late game thing. Uh, it added the decor, uh, diplomatic macro builder. It added a new uh, it enhanced the uh, religion Confucianism, and it also brought about the uh, prosperity, which is a feature for uh, states, which we will get into. In terms of necessity, I would rate uh, the Mandate of Heaven about 75%. It adds a lot of good things to the game for you, but it's not uh, entirely necessary. So in the vanilla game. Uh, patch 1.20 uh, started these ages. Uh, in vanilla, they don't do anything. They just here. As you can see, we start with the age of discovery. When Protestant uh, peers, it will start. It will trigger the age of reformation. Uh, 120 months, 10 years after that, uh, the age of reformation will start. Uh, global trade. Which is this institution? Once that uh, 1600, once that hits, which is roughly halfway through the game, uh, age absolutism will occur. Uh, so about 1610, roughly. I say roughly because sometimes it doesn't happen quickly. Uh, then we have the Age of Revolutions, which I would say about 1700s starts when the Enlightenment happens, which I believe is, yeah, it's this one. But in the vanilla game, all it does is show you, uh, is divide the game up in terms of uh, where, uh, what time you're playing. With the Mandate of Heaven, you get this, well, you can click this button actually now. It actually becomes a button instead of just something to look at. You get uh, uh, these buttons to press, these achievements to uh, acquire, and Splendor. Uh, Splendor is also part of Prosperity. I think. I'm not sure. I'm probably sure it's actually not. But, uh. So. Splendor. You get one uh, one base value. And then for every achievement you have here. You get uh, two. Additional two. Once you get to 800 Splendor. You can press one of these buttons. If they're in red. They mean you can acquire them. Uh, if they're in blue over here. That means you don't have the specific. Uh, thing you're not you can't get them because you're not specifically either a Venice here Denmark Portugal or the Ottomans so they get bonuses depending on their time uh, we start with religious conflicts for the first two ages and then we switch to absolutism for the next two ages these do trigger at the same time the other in the vanilla so, like, you start with the Age of Discovery, when Prozen occurs, you know, the Age of Reformation begins, Age of Absolutism occurs when global trade, uh, and the Age of Revolutions, so global absolution, and revolutions. Okay. You can see in between these, uh, the objectives are your achievements you want to do in the, in the meantime in the that part. To gain uh, more bonus splendor, 
blender gives you ability to press these buttons more often. If you acquire, if you have at least three achievements in an era, you can press this golden era. In an age, three achievement, three objectives in an age, you can get a golden era. Golden era lasts 50 years, but it gives you the gives you morale of armies, morale of navies, reduces the power cost to everything. Your goods produced modifier goes up, and your maximum absolution goes up. As Ming. You get this Emperor of China thing, which means you are currently the Emperor of... You get the Mandate of Heaven, which gives you the Emperor of China, Empire of China, which gives you this. The Mandate gives you, uh, you know, stuff. At full Mandate, you get National Unrest, Ability Cost Modifiers. At less than 50 Mandate, you get penalties. As it says there, you can gain it for having positive stability, having tributary states, and for prosperity in your country. Uh, you lose it by devastated provinces and neighboring uh, land-based land base, I have to specify land-based countries that are not tributaries. So, look at that. It's mandate we just went over currently you know uh, the value of tributaries versus non tributaries is based on their relative worth in terms of in terms of uh, development yeah that's the word as Emperor of China you get the diplomatic uh, action established tributary it is a Cassus Belli so you can go to war with anyone near uh, neighboring you in order to turn them into a tributary. Uh, being Emperor of China gives you bonuses for ma high mandate, which we've gone over. Allows you to use uh, metocracy mechanics. Gives you a permanent Cassus Bella on China. And gives you the Cassus Bella Unite China. And as I specified before, you can enforce tributary on neighbors. These celestial reforms are similar to the uh, Holy Roman Empire over there. Mechanics. Get a certain number of mandate. You can press this button. In general, instead of losing all your mandate, you lose the specified mandate. So uh, This is the uh, metocracy uh, things. Yeah. Mechanics. Uh, you get this. You can press one of these buttons. You get for... 10 years, I believe. Currently, it's ticking down. You get uh, metocracy for having... Uh, advisors. Each advisor gives you a plus, uh, 0.05 based on their... Based on their uh, value. So a level 3 would give you 1.5, a level 1 gives you 0.1, oh no, a level 3 gives you 1.5, a level 2 gives you 0.1, and a level 1 would give you 0.5. Also trading in uh, China work gives you a bonus. Any neighboring country has the uh, neighboring, what is it? Yeah. Neighboring uh, Eastern culture, uh, religion, such as Confucianism, uh, Tengri and Shintoism can declare war on the emperor on the on the current emperor of China for the mandate of heaven. Conversely, uh, as I said, you have the CB Unified China, which Korchin has one province of mainland China, or core China. I don't know, which is right here, I believe. So we go from Mongolia here, Mongolia here, North China region, or super region, yeah. Tributaries themselves act as more of a va sort of a vassal in that in a loose vassal, I would say above a protectorate, below a true vassal. Because these guys will pay you 
based on your action here. So it's like, hey, what do I demand as tribute, depending on whether they can. You can demand manpower, military power, diplo power, admin power, ducats. Default is always is ducats. You got these actions, additional troops. We send them manpower to help them wi uh, win a battle, reduce their liberty desire, uh, increase our prestige by increasing their liberty desire, send them money. Uh, make them send us money or send us additional tribute for more liberty desire and send them gifts to reduce the liberty desire. You get half for about two thirds. Yeah. It's twice as expensive for two thirds the worth. So not to take advantage of that. As you know, they, this vassal list for them and that's pretty much tributaries. Tributaries are not just limited to China. Japan can force tributaries. Anyone around here can enforce tributaries, I believe. The new Confucianism mechanic is this harmony mechanic. Um, high harmony gives you tolerance of the faith. Low harmony reduces that and also reduces your goods mod uh, modifier and your yearly uh, metocracy. Currently we're at 50, so we get yeah, nothing. Plus one increases. The other thing is harmonized religions. We are currently harmonized with Hamanya. That means we see Hamanya as a as a true faith. So we get that bonus for them. We can press this button over here. And harmonize with a different religion. Each time you harmonize with a religion, you get a an effect. Currently, we get idea cost minus seven. If you harmonize with the pagans, get religious unity and national unrest. Janagar, uh, that one, not for Janagar. Uh, it gives you uh, production efficiency. This gives you a national unrest. That would decrease the value, uh, the cost of advisors, so on and so forth. Press this button depending on how many states you have with that and their development costs. That's how long it will take to harmonize. But once you harmonize, you get that effect for the rest of the game. So it's pretty good. States have this new prosperity bar. So you can click on any state or province, go to the state tab, and get, uh, tell you your current prosperity. Uh, in order to gain prosperity, you need to have a state that has no devastation, which is this part right here. Devastation is a core mechanic released with 1.20 as well. So if it's scorched, if it's, uh, due to scorched earth or looting, this value will increase once uh, it will decrease because of other things like friendly fort and, and the fact that you control it makes it decrease by 0.1 per or 0.91 right there per year. Uh, but when you have no devastation and a positive and stabil uh, positive stability, that's what I meant to say, uh, you get prosperity. Uh, this prosperity uh, thing increases, and you get benefits including local goods produced, tax income, and monthly autonomy change. And that's pretty much prosperity. As the Shogunate of Japan, uh, which is currently it starts off as Ashikaga, where because they control Kyoto here, uh, you can become uh, shogunate by controlling Kyoto. Any da uh, daimyo can conquer Kyoto, become the uh, shogunate, but that usually requires a war with half the other half of the uh, map. So, as uh, shogunate, you get these options here. They last ten years but at the cost of legitimacy. So you can forcibly expel uh, Ronin, get Liberty Desire down, get diplomatic uh, reputation by the cost, at the cost of your vassal's reputation, uh, diplomatic relation limit. So they get one less relation. 
Uh, gets a manpower. It's a force limit increase. This is based on daimyos. These are just whatever. So they would lose uh, lose the manpower, uh, lose manpower, lose force limit. You would gain force limit and manpower, which isn't that bad. As always, these guys are vassals. Uh, I believe this is uh, part of it, the isolationist mechanics, I'm not too sure, but uh, as Daimyo, you can force them to change their iso isolationism. You can script a general from them, force them to contribute to capital. Uh, if they have declared war, you can make them uh, force uh, that in order to gain uh, monarch power at the cost of the li uh, their liberty desire and make them return land that they don't, uh, that they conquer from someone else. Those other buttons are from other things. Uh, Oh yeah, isolation is right here. This, um, this is a series of things that happens throughout the game. You can uh, go from adapt. Uh, you start out as adaptive, depending on your decisions during the uh, the incidents. So these incidents will happen with a series of decisions within them. At the end of them, they'll they will either change your they will up or it will change your uh, isolation level potentially if you choose so choose to do so at the end of every instant. So you have an active instance and all the past instance at the same time. Each uh, level of isolation gives you something different. At the end of eight incidents, you are stuck with whatever isolation limit. Uh, system that you want had at that time for the rest of the game. Probably the most important thing about this expansion for most players, if they're not playing in this region, is the macro builder. So you go to the production interface here, uh, go to the diplomacy tab, which is tab zero down here, which is a new tab for this expansion, and you can set your diplomats to do automatic things like neighboring countries, subjects, threatening countries, known sub. Yeah. You also can see at a very quick glance who would accept certain things like I knew would accept immediately a va uh, offer an alliance here. Um, annex vassal, offer vassalization, proclaim guarantees and warnings. And you can royal marry, claim throne, Issue embargoes and gifts and subsidies. Who would accept would be in green. People who would not accept are in red. Uh, we don't have uh, papal action, so we can't do tap that. And we're not the emperor, so we don't have that tap. Nations with the uh, Manchu primary, with the primary culture of Manchu. Get the ability to raise banners. Banners are raised at a rate of corruption. And they can be raised one per state, I believe. So yeah, every state can raise banners. They cause corruption. But in general, they do not require manpower to raise. They are raised at a your force your ratio so we can raise 100% cavalry at this point for some reason so all our so you get a mix of generally a mix of infantry cavalry at whatever your ratio would be uh, primarily uh, the uh, prioritize cavalry over infantry but they all these banners do have a discipline bonus and are displayed in purple. 
as opposed to the normal you know, blue. Uh, they are all raised. They all start at the cost you corruption, based on let's see what, based on one corruption of banner raised divided by the country's force limit. So we ended up with 1.7 for all those banners that we raised. They start at 100. They reinforce automatically. They do not require any manpower for recruitment or reinforcing until they fully reinforce. Once these guys are at 1,000 apiece and they suffer damage, they will then start uh, draining your manpower. But other than that, they are normal units with a discipline bonus. And that, I believe, is it for what is in the Mandate of Heaven. Thank you for joining me. Have a good day.